Good afternoon, everyone. Janelle, thank you. Um, again, my name is Esme Villarreal. I'm the very proud president and CEO for your local chamber, the Bronzeville Chamber of Commerce. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining in, joining today's live webinar. Um, we're very excited this afternoon to have the presence and, and collaboration of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, as we all know, we constantly are trying to, to update our businesses, our regions, of course, our city businesses, but most importantly, um, the ability to continue to bring to you different opportunities and educate everyone together as the constant changes. As you may know, recently the U.S. Chamber of Commerce started a program through their U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation called Safe Small Businesses Fund. The application process opened this yesterday, actually, this Monday, April the 20th. And um, earlier, before having everyone joining us in conversations with our, with our speaker today, Mr. Thomas Sullivan, um, we know that a lot has changed in the past 24 hours, and we're very grateful that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce um, have the ability to continue to bring this information to you and update you of the existing changes um, within the last 24 hours and of course of different other opportunities that are available currently for uh, businesses. Mr. Thomas M. Sullivan is the Vice President of Small Businesses Policy, Small Businesses, Business, I'm sorry, Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, working with Chambers of Commerce and the U.S. Chamber's nationwide, nationwide network. Mr. Sullivan harnesses the views of small businesses and translates that grassroots power into federal policies that bolster free enterprise and reward entrepreneurship. He runs the U.S. Chamber's Small Business Council, engaging those members on a regular basis to increase small business input and involvement in chamber activities. Previously, Sullivan was an attorney in the government relations practice of Nelson, Mullins, Riley, and Scarbo, LLP, a law firm with a major East Coast presence from Tallahassee to Boston. Before rejoining Nelson Mullins, he served as general counsel for the Bipartisan Policy Center, a nonprofit organization founded in 2007 by former Senate Majority Leaders Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell. Sullivan represented several firm clients before Congress and federal agencies and built a small business advocacy platform that included the Coalition for Responsible Business Finance, a group of non-bank small business providers, and the Small Business Coalition for Regulatory Relief. Sullivan served under President George W. Bush at the highest ranking government official charge with exclusively advocating the views and needs of small business before government agencies and Congress. As Chief Counsel for Advocacy at the U.S. Small Business Administration, he was directly involved in more than 100 regulatory and legislative matters, testified frequently before congressional committees, and was a spokesman on economic conditions and entrepreneurship. The hallmark of his tenure at SBA with a national legislative initiative guaranteeing that small business has a voice in state regulatory decisions. Upon leaving government, Sullivan was named to the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Legal Center Advisory Board, and he serves on the board of directors of the Global Entrepreneurship Network, a platform of programs and initiatives aimed at creating an entrepreneur ecosystem. Sullivan earned his Juris Doctor from Suffolk University Law in 1993 and a Bachelor of Arts in English in 1989 from Boston College. He lives in Virginia with his wife and two sons. Tom, welcome once again, and we thank you for your presence and for allowing us to learn together of the new opportunities offered by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and other existing programs at a federal level. And Tom, are you able to hear us? You've been unmuted. Aha. There, um, yes. <laughs> thank um, you. So, Esme, thank you. Um, the, the one thing that was left out of my, um, my background is that I, I married a Texan. So, um, 
Uh, Yeehaw, I wish, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I, wish, I wish I were able to be visiting uh, her family a little bit closer to where you all are down in Brownsville. Um, but I, I'm, I feel lucky to be able to talk with you all remotely. Um, let me first by let me first kind of jump right into what is unfortunately a little bit of an elephant in the room, and that is uh, this small business fund that our Chamber Foundation launched yesterday. Um, it was launched at two o'clock your time um, yesterday, and in the matter of seconds, thousands of applications came in and forced the vendor's website to shut down. Um, the, the foundation's team, the folks who I work with every day on small business initiatives, um, recovered all of those incoming um, applications that had flooded the system um, and late into the evening last night and realized that the $5,000 grants that had come in, uh, honestly, in less than 60 seconds uh, exhausted the entire funding for this program um, and I, I, I am just um, I, I'm humbled by the response that came in uh, yesterday and I, I, I feel terrible for those small businesses who are desperate for cash to keep their small business going and were unable to access and apply for these $5,000 grants. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend that, that this was some great successful venture. I, it wasn't. Um, and I think we learned a lot in the last 24 hours, um, mostly that good intentions and razor sharp attention to how something can work doesn't always result in a successful operation. And another thing that we learned, um, Esme, as, as you had said, was this unbelievable need by small businesses and the small business community to access capital to be able to survive the pandemic. Um, struggling a little bit with explaining this because it, as a lifelong advocate for small business, it's hard for me not to, to get emotional. Um, but I, I, I can assure you that the frustration and the anxiety and, and, um, the anger that may have accompanied yesterday when small businesses tried to access a fund that we widely promoted and weren't successful, that anger and frustration has been felt by all of us. And it has reignited our commitment to advocate for help for small business, which translates into um, what I'd like to share with all of you this afternoon. Um, if we could go to the next slide, it'd be great. So seven weeks ago, which uh, actually seems like seven months ago, I think probably to a lot of us, um, when it became clear that the coronavirus would not only make it to the United States, but deal a pretty severe blow to our economy. The, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce which represents 3 million businesses and it works with over 1,600 chambers of commerce like the Brownsville Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we put all of our muscle into lobbying Congress to help the business community quickly and it really pretty amazing and a fairly hyper-partisan environment that Congress passed three laws in three weeks. Each one of those laws has provisions to help employees and small businesses. I'm going to concentrate primarily on the last of those three laws, which is the CARES Act. Could we go to the next slide? 
should also explain that these two flows of federal funding ran out of money last week, both SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan and the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we are working with Congress to try to restore funding. We have a campaign that is hitting its peak right now and should peak through the next 24 hours. It's Save Small Business campaign. So if you went to the chamber website of uschamber.com slash save small business, you would see um, a contact your member of Congress and a number of other action oriented things to convince Congress to restore the funding for these two funding streams, the SBA economic injury disaster loans and the paycheck protection program. The disaster loan program reached its capacity last year. They stopped, SBA stopped taking applications. Also last Thursday at about 11.30 Eastern time, so about 10.30 your time, um, or not, excuse me, 9.30 your time, um, the Paycheck Protection Program loans that had $349 billion for small business loans also ran out of money. So this afternoon, uh, the Senate is very, very close to a deal. I'm looking at my watch. There should be a vote in 40 minutes uh, in the Senate that uh, gets 50 billion additional dollars to SBA's disaster loan program and $310 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program. So let's dive into the specifics of those programs. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and I, I apologize about all the words on this slide. I think you have to have uh, superhero vision to actually read it, but there's a lot of information. And um, Esme, I'll make sure that you can share these sh slides um, afterwards for folks who um, you know, experience writer cramp when they're trying to take all of this stuff down. When we talk about SBA's economic injury disaster loans, I, I think it's important for us to understand that this is not a new program. This is a 60 year old program and it is designed, it was and still is designed not to give quick cash to small businesses to create liquidity. The way the disaster program at the United States Small Business Administration was designed it was to help small businesses rebuild after a disaster. And historically, this SBA disaster loan program helps communities rebuild after tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and fires. Never really was designed to deal with a pandemic, but it's important to know that the intention, at least, is to provide funding for rebuilding. It is not a quick system. And I say that because initial applications for disaster assistance started on March 16th. Just last week, which is approximately six weeks, small business owners started to receive disbursements from SBA for that disaster loan application. Also last week, when the amount of funding um, reached its cap, they stopped accepting new applications. Generally at this point in the presentation, I go through how easy of an application it is. I mean, they, had, they had streamlined the application from a very difficult, cumbersome, resource-intensive process that could take two or three days to something that a small business owner can fill out in 15 minutes on their smartphone. So the streamlining of the application went very well, um, although the demand for the number of loans far exceeded any amount of funding that they had to fund them. The terms of an SBA economic injury disaster loan that comes directly from government to the small business, 
is that it's a 3.75% interest for a 30 year fixed term. Principal and interest are deferred for a year. And the way it works, once the applications get reopened, the small business goes to sba.gov slash disaster. You fill out the application and on the application, there's no information that says, how much of a loan do you want? Just says, um, I have experienced significant economic damage. I need mo money in order to survive. Um, here is some fundamental um, financial information and that goes into SBA. Then usually within two weeks, you hear from an SBA disaster loan specialist and that specialist communicates with you about things that a normal loan off a loan manager would, would discuss with you. What's your cash flow? What's your liquidity? Like if you have if you have enough cash on hand, then the loan officer's gonna question the fact that you need a loan in the first place. Uh, your debt history, things like that. Um, and and through that discussion you narrow in on what the loan about should be, you know, how much debt can you take on and, and things like that. Two weeks, generally two to three weeks later, so now you're at the total of that six, approximately six week process, the uh, SBA disaster loan specialist will contact you and say whether or not you get the loan, and then subsequent to that, the loan amount is ACH to your bank account. Now there's one part to this SBA disaster loan that is new with the CARES Act that just passed at the end of March. The CARES Act included a grant. It's called an emergency EIDL grant. EIDL stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That grant can be up to $10,000. And because it's a grant, it does not have to be paid back. And I think the most fascinating thing about this grant, because this is part of what was written into law in the CARES Act, is that even if that SBA loan specialist denies you the loan, you are still eligible for up to $10,000 from that emergency EIDL grant. Now, the way SBA has interpreted the legislation is that that grant be given to a small business in relation to their employee size. Um, and at least last week when they were dispersing these grants, SBA was dispersing those grants as $1,000 per employee. So if you had 10 or more employees, for instance, you'd receive the maximum $10,000 cap. Um, right now, as I had mentioned in, in the beginning of the presentation, Congress is considering adding $50 billion to this program. So let's shift now, if we could have the next slide, let's shift now from a government loan program to the PPP loans, that's Paycheck Protection Program loans. And these PPP loans come from the private sector bankers and lenders. Now when you see reference to the 349 or sometimes the press refers to these as the $350 billion that go to loans to small businesses. This is the program that they're talking about. And there is a specific legislative calculation for what the loan amount can be. So first of all, the criteria for being a small business. Generally speaking, and this is the same for the SBA disaster loans, generally speaking, you have 500 or fewer employees, then you are considered a small business. There are some exceptions that allow for slightly larger businesses to also be eligible. We can get into that in the questions and answers. Now, for the loan amount, what Congress has said in the CARES Act is they said, take a monthly average pay, payroll for the last year. It can either be 2019 or 12 months prior to the date of application. You are taking the payroll or how much you pay each employee up to $100,000. So if you have a senior manager in your small business who's making over $100,000, 
you uh, have to cap it at $100,000. Now, once you take that monthly average of payroll you, by month, you take one month, multiply it by 2.5, and that is your loan amount. Now, fast forward eight weeks after you get the PPP loan, at eight weeks, if you can show that 75% of the loan proceeds went to payroll and the other 25% went to utilities, rent, interest on mortgage, and interest on prior debt obligations, then the loan converts to a grant. The loan, which is at 1% for a two-year term, is forgiven. That's what makes the PPP loans so attractive. Now, a couple of things that I really want to emphasize here, three, three primary things. First of all, these are given out by private bankers and lenders. So when there's a gray area that you're not sure about, your answer is going to come from the bankers and the lenders who would give you the loan not from the folks who I work with generally in Washington, DC. The second thing that I wanna make sure folks know is that 1099 earners are not included in the employee count for payroll. So a small business who has two or three employees but relies on six to 15 1099 earners that small business can only apply for the PPP loan for its own employees. The 1099 earners are able to apply for PPP loans themselves. And what we see a lot of times are that the small business owners who have a banking relationship are able to connect in those 1099 earners into those bankers and lenders who they know personally um, to be able to access PPP loans for themselves. But they're not meant to be part of the payroll calculation for, per, for the purposes of that small business loan. The third thing is, well, actually there's four things. The third thing is that um, it's important not to forget that the loan itself is a really good deal. And we get really we really dive into the forgiveness component for obvious reasons. And sometimes we forget to kind of pull ourselves back and admit it's a 1% interest for a two year term, which is still a heck of a deal. And the intention is to provide liquidity. So if there's something that is not forgivable, you still get a pretty darn good rate that could keep you afloat through the pandemic so that you can come out okay on the other side without carrying too much debt burden. Last but not least, you can get both an SBA disaster loan, an economic injury disaster loan, and a PPP loan. However, you cannot commingle the assets. You cannot use the loan proceeds from an idle loan, for instance, to pay for payroll that you're supposed to be using the PPP loan. And the way that I've heard that this um, be taken care of is if you get a PPP loan, many bankers are suggesting to those small business owners, get a dedicated bank account for that PPP loan, because that will allow for you to keep close track of how you're spending it so that when you come back to that lender or banker in eight weeks, you have documentation on how you've spent it that is internal to the bank's records, which will enable you to get the forgiveness portion a little bit easier and a little bit quicker. Um, if we can get to the next slide. So the latest news, and this is certainly something that, um, that changes twice a day, every day. Um, a little bit of a background. So. What we experienced when the loans ran out yesterday, uh, excuse me, last, last week, um, that SBA actually managed to put out 
in 14 days did roughly the equivalent of what SBA manages for 14 years. So that gives you a little bit of an acknowledgement of how crazy this whole system is to start up a whole new lending program um, and see that type of volume. I guess that's a simple way of explaining that it, it did not go smoothly. Um, I mean, it's, it's been, there have been frustrations at every single level, probably the most important level being the small business level. Uh, but there's been frustrations by bankers, frustrations by our colleagues at Treasury and SBA and at the White House, and certainly frustrations uh, by folks like me and, and Esme and, and others. Um, the good news is that their frustration, those frustrations are all going in the right direction to try to help small businesses. Um, rough count from last week when money ran out, um, that there was about 200, excuse me, about uh, $1.6 million of, no, 1.6 million loans. Um, average size of those loans is about 215,000. Um, 4,975 lenders. Now, the reason why that number is so important is that there were only 1,800 lenders at the start of the program on April 3rd. So SBA and Treasury are letting more and more lenders into the system. We have been pushing them to allow more lenders in even while the lending program has been on pause. Um, and, and we're certainly hopeful that when Congress restores some funding, and additional lenders. Lenders like, um, like QuickBooks from Intuit, um, Square, uh, Cabbage, On Deck, uh, those are not traditional lenders. They are ready and willing to lend, uh, but they have not been completely cleared through the system. Um, and then I, I listed that Congress is considering additional $300 billion for PPP loans this week. So that actually has even changed. So it's up now to $310 billion. Um, and then they added, uh, based in large part on our recommendation, they added money for SBA's disaster program as well. We do have a campaign that is pushing Congress to do the right thing um, at uschamber.com slash save small business. We could go to the last slide. Now, there's more going on than just federal loan programs, obviously. Um, there, are, there are incredible things happening at a community level, at a state level, at a regional level. Uh, we are trying our hardest to capture as much information and get it to all of you as possible. So we, we rolled out our small business digital platform about 19 months ago. Um, it's at uschamber.com slash CO. Um, and by the way, that does not, this does not stand for coronavirus. It's actually, it, it, we did a whiteboard exercise and we wrote out all these words about community and cooperation um, and company and, and the unifying two letters in this entire exercise were CO. And so we created this whole digital platform called Grow With Co, uh, really kind of exciting, about 19 months ago. And this has been the focal point for us to get narrated content to small businesses that not only directs people to resources, but does it in a way that is as comfortable as, you know, reading a um, onboard airplane magazine or, um, you know, or Vanity Fair, or uh, it's not as racy as People Magazine, but you know, it, 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 the content is intended for every reader to re read every piece of content and take away a tool that will help them in their business, uh, which is unique. It isn't one of these uh, sites that just throws 20 different URLs in front of you and says, hey, here's 20 different websites, go have fun. It's, it tries to narrate content based on other small businesses experience that you can take away that will benefit from your businesses. So we're excited about it. It's never seen the amount of traffic as it has uh, 
during this pandemic, primarily because we know small businesses are so thirsty for information. We want to provide that information to you. And we do, we are passionate that no small business should decide to close its doors simply because it doesn't know what resources are available. And this digital small business portal is designed to help with that. Uh, so with that, um, Danielle and Esme, I'm happy to uh, answer questions. I see the, ch the chat We do here. have a couple of questions already. Okay. Uh, let's see, I can see the presentation. Oh, scroll down. Uh, we're not able to access the application, I'm sorry. Um, the bankers are not available to talk to you even if you leave a live message, call my bank, hear the phone being picked up and they hang up. Oh, that's horrible. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I was told by someone the other day that I would make a, a terrible banker because I would give uh, I would give money to any small business who needed it. Um, but then on the other hand, during the webinar yesterday, another person said, well, that's the type of banker we need. Um, I would say to Esme's credit, um, this is a time where the networks of a local chamber are so, so important. And um, in almost every webinar, it's answered similar to what is going on here. For instance, the next comment, um, by Ms. Moreno says that they applied at Lone Star National and they got approved. Now they didn't get the loan amount they wanted, but hopefully it is enough to uh, get through the um, pandemic. Um, so, okay, so there's a question um, by Ms. Abieta um, asking, what does it mean that SBA 7A lenders are opening to non-employer small businesses? So great question that actually hits on two things. So first of all, SBA 7A lenders. So in normal times, non-pandemic, SBA loans actually come from private banks all the time. And primary, their biggest loan program is 7A. Uh, which refers to a particular type of uh, location in a, in a law. And these banks have a contractual relationship with the Small Business Administration. So they have specific terms that they're allowed to write, and then SBA guarantees a portion of that loan. Now, the 7A lenders were the first 1,800 lenders in the PPP system. And the reason, I don't know about folks on this webinar, but every time I've gotten a new computer or a laptop and I hook it up and then I try to print something, the printer never works. And the reason is because the ones and zeros on the computer that has to communicate for the new computer to communicate with the old printer, those ones and zeros don't always line up. Very similar with how lenders interact with the Small Business Administration. 7A lenders who have a long standing relationship with SBA, when their data transmits to SBA, the ones and zeros are all in sync because it's an old computer, it's an old printer, and they, they're in sync. So that's why the 7A lenders were first, the first folks allowed into the PPP system. Now, as they onboarded more, they got up to over 4,900, uh, I forget what the number is. Um, it got over 4,000, sorry, 4,975. So 4,975 lenders. It took a while to make sure that the, those lenders' data were all in sync with the SBA systems. So, it took about a week, so from April 3rd to April 10th. And on April 10th, they opened up the PPP loans to independent contractors and sole proprietors. And this is what the questioner asked about. Um, those are the smallest businesses um, and are some of the hardest businesses for banks to help because the loan amounts are low enough 
So the banks generally aren't able to cover their overhead. But for the PPP loans, Congress said, you got to be able to give them to the independent contractors. So again, the seven day lenders were kind of first in. We are hopeful at the US Chamber that a lot of these non-bank lenders fill the void where some of these independent contractors who don't have a banking relationship will be able to access the PPP loans. So we're pushing very hard for Treasury to get assurance um, to these non-bank small business lenders to allow them to lend. And that's, that's the independent contractor uh, situation that has evolved. So there's a question about what if you, what if you filled out an application but you never got notified? Do you have to do the loan application again? I hope that you get notified and that the money doesn't run out again. So what has happened between last Thursday and today, Tuesday? We had a constant, inform, uh, constant information exchange between potential borrowers and bankers. And the question is, did SBA approve my loan before the money ran out? And the banks either say yes or no. But here's what's going on behind the scenes. The borrower contacts a bank, fills out whatever forms are necessary. The bank then make, makes a decision that they're gonna go ahead with the loan and sends that information to SBA. SBA reviews the information and it assigns a loan number sends that number back to the bank. As soon as that bank gets the loan number, then the money is actually fenced off and available. So the small business owners who are talking with a bank and that bank says, yes, we have an SBA loan number, they got the money before the money ran out. There are others who are told by their bank, we submitted it, we did not get a loan number. Now I talked with my friends at SBA last night and I asked specifically, how are you supposed to know with your bank where it was in that process? And they told me completely up to the individual banks. So some banks, um, there are some banks who we've talked with who have all that information ready to go, as soon as the funding is restored, they're gonna hit send, and all that data is then go to SBA. So that, that means basically two things. One is the system's gonna become overwhelmed almost immediately, so it's gonna take a while for that to unfold. And two is that the, the businesses have been frantic to talk with their bankers between last Thursday and today, to ask what is the status and those conversations continue um, and you know maybe as me and I can look at a date in October or November where we establish a national hug your banker day because uh, those folks are working so hard to try to get the money but checking on status is certainly something that's encouraged and I certainly hope you don't encounter situations where people hang up on you it's, it's terrible um, the PPP apply for business does not have an active payroll, but is ready to hire. Um, no, it does not. So the basis of, you have two types of basis for what the loan amount is. Either last year's payroll, or there is an exception for a startup. You could take January and February of this year and do the same calculation. And then that's your calculation. Or if you're an independent contractor, you got to look at last year's net income. So that is on your uh, 1040 Schedule C, line 31. So we, have a, um, we don't have to get our taxes in until July. However, if you're an independent contractor or a 1099 earner or a gig worker or a freelancer or sole proprietor, you actually have to have that filled out. Um, I don't think you have to have filed it you have to have that filled out because the bank's going to want to see your net income that's on line 31 of that schedule C to do the assessment with you on what your monthly average is and then multiply by one point, excuse me, 2.5, which comes up with your loan amount. What is the status for tenant self-employed? 
Um, I think I, I just explained about the 1099s. Those are the um, independent contractor, self-employed, sole proprietor, gig worker, freelancer. Um, someone said that they were uh, processing applications from California first. I, I have not heard that before. We do see different banks are, and credit unions and other finance organizations really are handling this all differently. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, we represent so many uh, of, of these different financial institutions. I'm told I'm not able to pick my favorites, kind of like I'm not able to pick which, which of my teenage boys is my favorite. Um, I can't really get into that. Um, we applied for the EIDL loan on 32920, have not been contacted by an SBA loan specialist. Um, so it's actually, it's good that you've seen a hard inquiry on your credit because that means they're checking. Um, trying to do the math. You should be hearing from an SBA loan specialist any day now. It's averaging about two weeks to hear from the specialist and four to six weeks to get disbursement. Um, I wish there was a way for this disaster program to be more transparent about where people are in the queue. You know, similar to if you have a package delivered um, to the Brownsville Chamber of Commerce, you're able to track exactly where it is. Um, unfortunately, SBA does not possess that capability, but, but when Congress is looking at revamping that program in the months and years ahead, I mean, that's something that we're going to be pushing for because heard a lot uh, from small businesses who are really frustrated uh, about checking on where their loan is in the, in the process. And quite frankly, the true customer service hotlines and the email it takes a lot of staffing for them to man these. So it seems as though the resources um, could be perhaps better deployed uh, with the use of better technology. Although it's easy to be an armchair quarterback with uh, the situation that they're trying to deal with and try to help small business. What's the new plan for small businesses? Uh, PPP exhausted, small amount, all right, so, uh, so Ms. Moreno asks uh, a fairly broad question about, well, are there other sources of capital? Um, the simple answer is, I don't know. Every community is different. Um, there are incredible programs that exist where communities are coming together uh, and, and trying to help. We are trying to capture as much of it as possible on uschamber.com slash co. Um, and, and we'll be pushing for every possibility of funding that we can. Uh, people that applied at the end of March just started receiving funds late last week. Um, from Ms. Juarez. Uh, yeah, so the, the SBA disaster program did hire Amazon Web Services and also a subsidiary of Quicken's Rocket Mortgage to try to speed things up on the back end. Sounds as though that they're getting some movement on that, which is a good thing. Um, oh, so, uh, there, so Carmen asked whether or not there is a website we can check if our loan has an SBA loan approved. Um, if you're talking about the disaster loan, there are two customer service lines plus an email. And um, I will make sure to get those to ESME after this call. If it's the PPP loans, every bank is handling that differently. There are some uh, that have electronic tracking systems, others do not. Oh, um, tremendous news from uh, Ms. Selby that she was uh, able to access the um, Save Small Business Fund run by our um, Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, we are told that it, it will take seven days. So um, a week from yesterday, you will uh, 
you will uh, give the hopefully get get the five thousand uh, dollars or or deny. But seven days is the is the promise that the foundation made for all applicants. Tom, we, we have a question um, from our friends um, at SBDC. They're asking you there if you have a knowledge of the documents that are required to prove to lender how funds were used during the eight week period. Oh, great question. So great question. The, so the simple answer is no. Um, the more complicated answer is that guidance from SBA and Treasury have been issued simultaneous with the development of these programs. So for instance, on April 2nd, the night before loans were available, Treasury was finalizing the guidance on how banks were supposed to do the loans. Um, immediately after that, SBA and Treasury finalized guidance on how you're supposed to apply for the loans. We expect within the next six weeks, you're going to see guidance on how the loans should be forgiven. What we do know is just taking from the advice from the bankers who speak with us at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they're saying that what they're advising many of their clients is open up a separate checking account for the PPP loan at the bank that gave you the loan. And that will allow for you to have at least a better or more efficient tracking mechanism for what you spent the money on. Um, now that, that doesn't mean that it's a foolproof system, but it, at least from a banker's perspective of what they think they need to make turn that loan into a grant, that's a good starting point. Um, but I, I can assure you, as soon as that guidance is out, it will be, uh, rather than get, you know, sending you on like a scavenger hunt on these different government websites, it will be on uschamber.com slash co. Um, because I work with those editors every day. They are updating that site twice a day, every day. Um, and we get really excited when there's information that can help you because then we narrate that into stories that answer these questions. Hey, Tom, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned that for the PPP that you have to at least use 75% of it for payroll mm -hmm. and the other 25 for utilities and rent, um, but can you use a PPP 100% for payroll, and will it still be forgiven? Yes. Great. I have another question, uh, Tom. This is Esme. So, um, you know, as we move forward and we planned, and there's, you know, of course, unprecedented times, and and we we we're planning for the future without knowing what the future holds, right? Um, is there an existing uh, plan being built? as we go through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for business recovery? Or is there a toolkit currently in existence um, that we can you know, be able to share with you know, all businesses in the area to us as a chamber and of course, um, you know, as a responsibility of the organization and of course a social responsibility, we have an obligation with our businesses which are, it's not taken lightly. So as we grow and we, we grow in, in, you know, through these pains and new experiences, we find that uh, a vast number of businesses don't have a contingency plan. They're not prepared. And what we need to do is be better prepared for future crisis that may happen when we don't know. But how we move forward and how do we prepare for our small businesses to remain open and, and have an existing plan? Um, so Esme, thank you for that question. So, um, we have an initiative underway at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce called Path Forward. Yes. And while, I mean, I see the lens through, or I see the world through the lens of small business. Like I'm worried about tomorrow and maybe if I'm lucky next week. Um, I'm lucky to work with colleagues who are able to look further out. Um, and they've developed this 11 page 
uh, structure called Return to Work, and it's part of the Path Forward project. Um, there's two things happening. So if you Googled US Chamber Return to Work, you'll see an 11 page document that is largely a thought provoking exercise that will rely on ESME, on you and thousands of your colleagues to provide input to kind of put the meat on the bones of what returning to look work looks like and identifies the federal policies that have to be put in place to bolster the ability of the business community to get back to work. And so we're excited about that project. Um, and, and I'll make an offer to you, Esme, um, because there's two different projects that are moving forward simultaneously. So we have the Path Forward project that includes Return to Work. But our, our small business digital platform, you know, uschamber.com slash co, we, we want to capture the real life experiences of small businesses who themselves are reopening. So right now, for instance, we're trying to talk with some small business owners in Germany, uh, overseas, who just this week are starting to reopen. Because what we're finding is if, if we can provide that connectivity of, well, this is something that a retail shop did in Germany, or there are some beaches that are reopening in Florida this weekend, for instance, and we can capture like a beach t-shirt shop like what are they doing in Florida? If we can get these narratives down, out of that will come kind of a best practices regimen that we want to share with as broad a community as possible. So I make you as me the offer of it, as you come across different small businesses who are experiencing both positive and negative, we're not afraid of like bad stuff either. Um, then we would love to talk with them and incorporate them into some of these narratives that will inform then a even broader universes of small businesses so that we really get that type of community connectivity going forward. Absolutely, we would love to participate and be, you know, partake in this initiative. I think we have the obligation to tell the story of our small businesses. And this allows us to really, you know, have that genuine conversation and connect um, to really, like you said, regardless being a, a positive or a negative, of course, um, conversation of the outcomes, I think we all need to learn from the experiences. So I will definitely participate in this initiative. Oh, thank you. I um, did get a question, Tom, um, oh. asking about the eight-week period. Um, oh, yeah. Does it start from the loan date or the funding date? As soon as that money hits your bank account is when the, uh, the clock starts ticking. And then the follow-up to that is another person asking, um, do you have to spend the allotted amount accordingly within the next eight weeks in order to have the loan forgiven? Um, it's our, you know, that that's come up a few times. The honest answer is we don't know. We assume that you do, um, but we're not, but we're not positive. And I expect that the guidance coming out from SBA and Treasury within the next six weeks will elaborate. Uh, on that. So our gut instinct is yes, the funds, in order to be forgiven, the funds actually have to be spent. Um, but that gut instinct is generally better off when it's verified with the official, you know, United States Treasury or United States Small Business Administration seals. Um, and and uh, with that, I'll, I'll, Esme, I'll, I'll certainly thank you for allowing me to talk with your membership. And I'm going to follow up with you on those disaster assistance helplines so that um, your membership has those handy. Tom, once again, we thank you from the bottom of a heart. We know um, how true an advocate you are for small businesses and you're truly a cheerleader for all the chambers and of course, um, businesses as a whole. Um, just, you know, as a follow-up of today's webinar to all those participants, we will be uh, downloading the recording of today's conversation. We will also, should it be fine with Tom, we will be sharing the presentation that has information available to all those 
that were here today and for those that were not able to participate, we do share this information uh, via email and of course through social media uh, posts as well. Um, we do look forward to future collaborations with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We are very blessed to have the support of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that continuously advocates for small businesses 24-7. We look forward to positive um, you know, news in the, in the next 20 minutes to come possibly from Congress in which they allocate more funding. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much to all the participants. Should anyone have questions or need additional information regarding of existing programs, either federal, state, or local, do contact your local chamber at 956 542-4341 to better assist you. Good afternoon to everyone. And Tom, once again, we thank you. Thank you, Esme. Bye, folks. Bye.